Hi, I'm Brian Seigen, co-founder and CEO of The Exercise Coach, where our coaches guide people of all ages to get the health and fitness results that matter most to them with no more than two 20-minute workouts per week. We use cutting-edge strength training technology from Exerbotics, and our training appointments are delivered in small, clean, professional exercise suites in more than 100 locations around the world. And our approach is all about strength. And that's because strength changes everything. It changes every system of the body for the better. And it fundamentally changes the time and effort required to get optimal exercise results. And today I have a special guest with me, Dr. Doug McGuff. And we're going to be talking about COVID-19 and masks and personal strength training. Dr. McGuff is a board-certified emergency room physician. He's the author of the go-to resource, Body by Science. He's also the owner of Ultimate Exercise, a one-on-one strength training office in Seneca, South Carolina. And really, he is one of the world's top experts on evidence-based strength training. And Doug's had a huge influence on my 20-year career, so I am so glad to have Dr. McGuff with us today. And again, we'll be talking about COVID-19, wearing masks, and, and personal strength training. Um, and Doug, thank you so much for giving of your time today, and welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. So it's, it's been a few weeks. Um, we talked early on um, a, a couple months ago, and I just wanted to start out asking you, you mentioned then that anything you said could could really change, that it was a, a fluid situation. And so uh, a couple months later, uh, just to take it from the top, what's, what's different about where we're at today from your perspective, either uh, in your role as an emergency room physician or as a, an owner of a fitness facility? Um, on a global basis, at least here locally, we had a pretty serious lockdown in the latter half of March and all of April, and we closed Ultimate Exercise for that month. Um, and the incidence of illness went down, um, both, you know, community wide and what we were seeing in the emergency department. Um, so at the beginning of May, the lockdown started to relax and people were released to the wild again. And, you know, as, as, as what one would expect, the incidence started to rise again and now we're having new spikes. Um, and the reaction to that has been, um, you know, what everyone sees in the news and um, with other things going on, a lot of times people's reactions to that are more based upon their um, political affiliations or preconceived notions than really anything nuanced at all. So it's gotten a little crazy. Um, from what here in South Carolina, we're having a pretty significant surge in cases. Um, but you know, as I look at it, I don't think that's to be unexpected with this type of virus and a coronavirus. I think any notion that we could lock down to an extent that we eradicate the disease is, you know, measles or smallpox was by vaccination. I think that's, that's not going to happen. I think the original purpose of lockdowns was to flatten the curve well enough where the healthcare system could handle it. And the problem wasn't so much the disease, but the fact that the healthcare system was at the brink at the beginning of this and always has been. So it had no surge capacity. So everyone kind of locked down for the benefit of the sickest people in society and the hospitals that had to care for them. But when you flatten the curve, you lengthen the curve. So if you just let it run wild, it would go through its bell curve distribution in a fairly short span of time, six to 12 weeks. But if you're going to flatten the curve, you're going to lengthen the curve. And, you know, what we're seeing now is that cycle of locking down, cases go down, people relax, open back up, more cases happen, people freak out, lock it back down over and over again. Um, and then, you know, the middle ground solutions to that, you know, wearing masks in public and, you know, spacing people out and social distancing and all those measures to try to kind of manage the situation are at play right now. And that's kind of where we find ourselves. I think the other place that we're going to have to find ourselves is measuring the case numbers, the severity of illness and the number of deaths and weighing that against um, other issues. Um, 
you know, children being locked up in homes and less than ideal circumstances, um, the psychological effects of loss of social contact, um, the economic effects of taking the gigantic flywheel, which is the world economy, and being careful not to slow it down to the point that this gigantic heavy flywheel we can never get moving again. All of those things are other morbidities and mortalities that gotta be weighed against our response and we're just in the middle of it right now. And once again, everything that I can tell you is just an opinion. It doesn't reflect the health system I work for, doesn't reflect any official health governing body. It's just, you know, someone that's in the middle of it, just like you guys are. Got it. Yeah, thanks for that, Doug. And <clears throat> yeah, like you said, it, it seems now we're at this point where there's just not, uh, it, it, it requires nuance to even be able to discuss solutions. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a hard situation and obviously a situation that has huge implications. And so uh, there's strong feelings about, about, what are the right solutions? And uh, if it were, if it were easy, uh, it'd be obvious, and um, yeah. we wouldn't have much to to to, to debate and, and discuss. But it's not it's not easy. It's complex, and it's obviously just uh, existentially, you know, significant to us all. The directions that we take. Um, what um, do you feel like right now? We have have we gotten a firm grasp even on how uh, the disease is transmitted? Is there more than one prime, you know, more than one way that is really sort of primary. Um, what do you think? Yeah, no, we don't have a firm grasp on it. Um, we do know like most respiratory viruses that it is predominantly spread by droplet contamination. Okay. Um, there's a continuum between droplet and aerosol, which is basically just decreasing the size of particles. Um, and then there's some component of fomite transmission being on surfaces, but to put it in the most broad heuristic possible, I think the worst thing to do is be in a large group of people in a confined indoor space where there's lots of um, phonation going on. And that can be talking, you know, just starting from the bottom and working our way up talking yelling, singing, um, and moving on up the scale like that within a confined space. Um, and how long you're confined within that space is going to determine the risk of infectivity. The opposite of that, being outside and moving about with other people in the open air and in the sunshine um, is in, in my opinion, probably such small risk is not even to be seriously concerned about. Um, being outdoors with other people spaced out is probably completely safe in the daytime, nearly completely safe at nighttime, but when you start packing people together tightly um, in the daytime, probably marginally risky. At nighttime, it's much more risky because the virus is so sensitive to UV light that you know there's a whole spectrum between being locked into a small room with a bunch of people yelling um, and that's predominantly what we're seeing right now in our resurgence of um, COVID-19 here in South Carolina it's predominantly Hispanics and it's because a lot of them are living in small multi-generational homes and you know when you hot box the virus you know you're just gonna your likelihood of picking it up is going to be greater. Mm. So yeah, we've all been we've all been trying to learn a lot in the last couple of months, and uh, we're people are becoming familiar with terms and concepts that probably they they never wanted to become familiar with. Uh, one is, and it might be related to what you're talking about in terms of risk, that I think it'd be helpful for you to elaborate on a little bit is just this concept of viral load. Can you explain what people are talking about when they talk about viral load? It seems like we talk about, you know. Um, uh, infectivity. Yeah. But how does viral load play into someone getting sick? Yeah. So 
viral loads is basically the number of viral particles that are coming into your body, into your respiratory tree at a given moment in time. So, you know, I get exposed to really high viral load situations at work a lot. So, but when I am going to be in that situation, I get into full protective gear um, so that my risk is mitigated. But just working indoors in an ER is, you know, a moderate risk situation because despite your best efforts, you're in a closed environment where that's kind of circulating around. But when I'm out and about in the department, I was just to wear a simple surgical mask. Um, which seems to be enough to mostly mitigate against the disease. Um, so viral load pay, plays a significant component of what your risk of catching something is. So, you know, the closer you are to someone in a more confined space, the more viral particles that are available to infect. So more than infect, um, you know, when they get into your cell, they're using your body as a Xerox machine to make copies of itself. You know, if you just inhale three viral particles, they get into three respiratory cells and they make 30,000 virus. You know, even someone with a pretty weak innate immunity is going to just rush in and beat that down. But if you inhale a million viral particles and they all get into respiratory cells and they start multiplying and you have a billion viral particles, that may outstrip your body's innate response of sending in, you know, white blood cells, killer T cells, and inflammatory cytokines to crush it. So it's just a matter of dose more than anything. So I that's why, the, that's why the, the, it, the situation and the time you're in that situation matters, because the time you're in that situation will, will multiply out uh, the, the, the total number of, of, of viral, viral particles you encounter. Correct. And if you look at the studies where they, you know, looked at the cruise ships and the people that were confined on them, they got quarantined on the cruise ship, which is like the worst scenario to be in, in terms of viral load, or um, the USS Roosevelt that, you know, all the sailors were confined on there. You know, even then, not the majority of people became infected. It was, you know, a significant percentage, much higher than you would otherwise. Um, but it wasn't you know, 100%, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you might be looking somewhere in the realm of 25 to 40% in the worst case scenario. So um, I think the other thing people kind of, we're really paying attention to the nature of the virus, um, but we need to pay more attention to the nature of the host and the host response. Mm. Um, because all the bad outcomes are occurring in hosts that are really, really, um, fragile and susceptible. Mm. Um, and there are, you know, measures in terms of diet, in terms of sun exposure, in terms of vitamin D status, in terms of exercise um, that greatly mitigate against the risk of you, you know, becoming truly infected or having a bad um, response to infection should it happen to you. Got it. Got it. And in, in, in it sounds like, I mean, how, what's your sense of how long you think we're going to be battling this? I, the honest answer is no one has any idea. If they say they do, then that's someone to disregard. Um, it may be forever. This virus may be with us forever. It may have a seasonal waxing and waning variation to it. Um, or it may simply kind of peter itself out. The thing that's unique about this virus is that it has um, a, a base sequence within its genome, within its RNA, called a furin group. And furin is a catalase enzyme that exists in our cells. It cleaves proteins. You see the coronavirus and all the little spikies on it? Those are mm -hmm. actually glycoproteins, combination of sugars and protein molecule that give it its unique identity. Well, this virus has acquired a furin sequence in it that allows it to recognize these furin enzymes in human cells and use it against us, so to speak. And that's never been seen in a coronavirus. It's been seen in influenza viruses and para-influenza viruses. And what it does is you have this really long glycoprotein and this furin group will cleave off a significant chunk of that and make it smaller. 
that makes it easily attachable to the ACE receptor on cells so it can get into the cell and replicate. The cell replicates itself millions of times, or not the cell, the virus replicates itself millions of times, but with that glycoprotein intact. But the catch is with that furin group, as it exits the cell, it gets cleaved off again. So the new ones that get made as it exits the cell, that little glycoprotein gets cleaved, which raises in its infectivity. So a virus that has this furin group um, can get deeper, much deeper into the respiratory tree. And once it does that, it can actually infect neighboring cells, but also get into the circulation and infect tissues all over the body, which is why we see you know, so many different manifestations of the disease in people. That so that's what's unique about the virus, and it's what made a lot of people speculate that this thing came out of the lab because that furin group to develop spontaneously is kind of in a coronavirus is kind of you know difficult to explain. It's not impossible. It's a very random event, but it's a extremely low likelihood random event. Um, so you know it could have been something that was being worked with in a lab that just got out. Wow. In any case, it makes for a very unique virus. It's probably going to be with us for a while. And I guess that's, <clears throat> I guess that's the point. And so understanding what preventive measures make the most sense and doing something to become a, a, less, a, a, a less vulnerable host are things that, that people should be thinking about. It's not, people shouldn't be thinking, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hunker down here and be careful for a few weeks. Um, especially not if they're, you know, um, uh, overweight or have high blood pressure or diabetes. Yeah. It, they shouldn't be thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide and this thing's going to go away. We should be thinking about becoming healthier, becoming more fit, because it, it could be with us for a long time. Right. I can tell you, I mean, it is my opinion, and this is just my opinion, that if you're a person that has multiple medical diseases, you're on 33 medications, that yes, you are the person that should hunker down and mm. isolate in place. Mm -hmm. but you're also the person that real needs to realize you cannot do that forever. Mm. And you need to make changes that are going to make you not that person. Um, because what's becoming more and more clear is that I don't think that anyone in that situation can ask the entire rest of society to lock down and sacrifice for their benefit necessarily. I mean, it's just um, a viable option. It's not a matter of choice or ethics or anything like that. It's just not a doable thing. It's going to degrade at some point. And, um, you know, you can't be a person that has to be locked down forever. The flip side of that coin is if you're not that person, if you're healthy, if you're taking these mitigating measures, I think you can afford to be a lot less scared than the public in general is. Mm. Um, I think, you know, one interesting exercise is just go to the CDC website and look at the death rate per year. And if, and you can compare it year to year. And if you compare this year's death rate up to this day compared to last year's death rate, um, we're only at about 97 or 98 percent of last year's death rate and that's even accounting for the people that have died as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and when you parse that out kind of statistically what that might say is that everyone that has died of COVID-19 at least in terms of this death rate statistic on a very gross gross heuristic may have been someone that would have succumbed from something else anyway. Um, you know, no one's really trying to parse that out. How many of these were people with end-stage disease in nursing homes um, that, you know, were in the, in the crudest sense possible 10 years beyond their expiration date anyway, only kept going by, you know, revolving through the revolving door of the medical system. So, um, you know, the deaths due to COVID-19 are tragic, but when you look at them in the bigger context and try to, I think we really need to parse out who are the people that are dying and, um, you know, might they have died of something anyway is an important question as we contemplate how locked down are we going to be with all this. Sure. Yeah, I can relate to that personally. My 
grandmother was a hundred years old and uh, in a nursing home and she did contract COVID and, um, and, and did pass away within uh, about a week. And, and so yeah. she's an example of the calculations. I mean, we have massively disrupted um, the supply chain for food. Someone needs to do the calculation. How many people worldwide are going to die of starvation as a result of a response to the death rate from COVID-19? There's everything exists as a trade-off and there are going to be trade-offs to this that need to be calculated so that we can make appropriate decisions about it. Because it, it's, you know, how many children that are on WIC and rely on, you know, school breakfast and lunch are now not going to get it and are going to be staying at home in an environment that is, you know, potentially abusive and dangerous. Mm. You know, how many of those kids are we going to be willing to sacrifice to offset, you know, um, bad outcomes on the other end? Um, these are real life things that are happening right now. And, you know, frankly, people's mental health is at stake. And that's one thing that I've seen. If I can measure the morbidity of COVID-19 across the board, the biggest morbidity I have seen is people's mental health. I mean, people are going off the rails. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Anyway, I've, we, I've, I've, I've seen that the, personally as well. Just, fr you know, friends. The, yeah. Yep. Well, know, let's look. Oh, go ahead, Doug. A little bit here. Yep. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I wanted to get into a little bit about masks today, just because this okay. is something that as a fitness business, we're really faced with, with locations all over the country, different communities with, with different degrees of, of concern or sensitivity right now to things in, in different perspectives. And um, so for us, we've got, we've got all kinds of uh, different combinations out there. Um, it seems to be a fairly contentious issue. It seems to be that there's a contingent of people who uh, believe very, very strongly um, that everyone should be, should be wearing a mask. And if we're not making people wear masks in our fitness business, you know, we're, we're doing something that in their eyes is, is, is wrong. What, what we've done across the country, we've put in a, a, pretty, a, a pretty comprehensive plan in place, but at the top of it is we're complying with all federal, state, and local requirements. And so if, if in any place we're required to wear masks, um, we make sure that happens. Where we're not, uh, we... We, we will make them optional. And in some cases, we've gone beyond that. And we have just uh, an individual business owner has, has said, I'm going to require masks inside my business. Sure. Um, but we're at a point where basically we can't please everybody because people feel strongly one way or the other about it. And there's different uh, combinations of scenarios out there. So I just thought maybe talking about it a little bit yeah. would be helpful. So let, I'll, I'll try to provide you some information that it won't tell you what to do, but at least give you some framework for decision-making. Perfect. And again, a, some of this is fact, a lot of it's just my opinion, but let's talk about masks first in terms of type of mask and their purpose. So um, a simple surgical mask um, or a cloth mask or what you commonly see the public wearing when a mask edict is active um, the purpose of that mask is not to protect the wearer necessarily. The purpose of that mask is to protect others around the person wearing the mask. So think of a simple mask as a chain link fence. And the virus is a gnat. So the virus can easily fly through the gaps in a chain link fence. But the virus doesn't just exist as a free-floating particle when it leaves an infected person. It is leaving either as droplet or aerosol. So a droplet is like a beach ball with a bunch of gnats stuck to it. So if you throw a beach ball with one million gnats stuck to it against the chain link fence, you might have a hundred gnats that get through. That's what a simple mask is doing, is it is preventing the droplet spread, mm. which greatly mitigates the viral load that's leaving the infected person. So wearing a simple mask 
is to protect those around the person wearing the mask. Okay. And they are, it's very effective because you're really taking the rate limiting factor, which is droplet spread and greatly diminishing that. And the rebound of droplets back to the infected person has little or no consequence because if they've already been manufactured now the body bouncing back doesn't really matter so much. It's good to know. Now, the problem that I see with the public mandates to wear masks is that the importance of wearing a simple mask is to do it correctly. And I'm seeing it done incorrectly all the time. Hmm. So if the wearing of a simple mask makes you touch your face even 10% more to adjust it or fiddle with it, you've completely obviated any benefit from it. If you do what I see so commonly is that people get tired of it and if no one's nearby, they'll pull it down below their nose. Or if no one's around, they'll pull it down below their chin and then bring it back up. Mm -hmm. Well, what's happened when you've done that? When you've done that is when you're breathing, coughing, or sneezing and you pull it down, you now have this fabric on which you have now coated the exterior of that fabric with droplets. So now what you've done is you've taken the beach balls, stuck them on the other side of the chain link fence and adhered them there. So when you put your mask back up and you start talking or if you cough or sneeze, now what you have is all those droplets with millions of viral particles on them sitting on the mask like a drum head that then vibrates and launches all that out. Wow. So if you wear a simple mask, wear it. But if you pull it down below your nose, or if it drifts down below your nose, mm. or, you, or it's down, or you see people pull it down below their chin, anyone that's doing that needs to be instructed, okay, take it off and throw it away. The moment you've done that, it is, it is worse than useless. You've made it much worse. Wow. I see this in restaurants where the waiters are mandated to wear masks all day long every time i go so you've taken a situation where it was risky and in the intent which is mostly security theater to make it less risky you've now risky because if it's down below their nose they breathe on the exterior poof it goes out hmm. okay but a simple mass is to protect those around so in a training facility i am having my instructors wear a simple mask and I am not mandating my clients to wear a mask unless they prefer to. Mm -hmm. Now, so an N95 mask is like the, I mean, I mean, a regular mask is like a chain link fence and its purpose is to protect the person not wearing the mask. An N95 mask's purpose is to protect the wearer from virus. And okay. basically, it's not a chain link fence. It is much, much tighter um, mesh. So that if it's so tight that a virus can get through it, but it's got to like really wriggle through it, um, like it's trying to squeeze through the bars of a jail cell. Some of them can still get through as the mass degrades over time. Um, it gets a little bit worse. But its purpose is if there are viral particles or aerosol out there, the wearer is protected from inhaling them. So when we go into an active COVID case patient room, especially if we're going to be doing an aerosolizing procedure, if we're going to be giving them nebulizer treatments, suctioning them, doing an endotracheal intubation, then we're gonna wear one of those type of masks for our protection. Mm. So people, when you get in these sort of circumstances, get very oriented towards their own safety. And people go out wearing masks, you have to realize when you're wearing your mask, you're doing it for the benefit of the people around you. The simple mask you're saying? Yes. Okay. And people need to wear it with that in mind. Yeah. But if you're wearing it as security theater and you're pulling that thing down below your nose, and that's the one thing I would tell facility owners, if you have instructors and you're having the mask, it's not enough just to have, you've got to wear it properly. And if you're adjusting with it and fiddling with it, and you pull it down below your nose. The moment you do that, throw the mask away and get a new one and don't mm -hmm. fidget with it. Mm -hmm. 
but most people wearing a mask are going to touch their face five to ten times more often than they would have if they weren't wearing one. So wearing masks is important, but I'm watching these congressional hearings. And I'm watching these congressmen pull their mask down, talk into the microphone, put it back up, and it's, it's worse than you do it that way. It makes the risk of spread much higher if you're not just wearing it continuously. And if you're going to pull it down, get a breath, you've just ruined it, throw it away, get a fresh one. Yeah, I just can't help thinking that it's, we, we really, we tend to just enjoy having very binary discussions. You yeah. know, mask, no mask. They're good, they're bad, and there's much more nuance to it. Right, and there's much more effort on the mm. part of the individual. And that's what's getting lost, is we're all focused on societal-wide um, responses to this, and we need to focus on what our individual responses are. And that makes a much, much bigger impact. Mm. Now, at UE, I mean, what we're doing is we can see out the front window. We have parking lot waiting. You know, we mix up 10% Clorox solution. We spray down all contact surfaces between clients, and our instructors wear simple masks. The client can wear a mask if they want to. They can wear a simple mask. They can wear an N95 mask if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, most people find it a little bit claustrophobic to wear a mask in that circumstance, especially when you get huffing and puffing. Um, but, you know, I don't think that there's going to be a bad effect if someone wishes to do that as a, as a trainee, as a client training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the next, the next question I have to ask, and I know I want to be respectful of your time. So there's, there's two questions I want to make sure we give you a chance to to speak to um, that are important, I think, to, to us right now. Uh, one, just, you know, I hear sometimes, well, it can't be safe to, one, either wear a, a mask all day, you know, <clears throat> if, if you're requiring uh, an employee to wear a mask all day, that can't possibly be healthy for them. I'm hearing that. But then also this idea of, of safety um, while working out. Is there, is there anything, generally speaking, that is unhealthy about wearing a mask while performing a, 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 a productive workout. Yeah, I find this funny because there was a, I don't know if you saw it on like Instagram and YouTube and all these video memes of all these people doing these really gnarly looking high intensity interval workouts and these deadlift workouts and stuff wearing the gas masks. Yeah, exactly. The sure. The thing is like, well, how come like six weeks ago it was a thing and now it's It was like, a training tool. It's the work of the devil now. Um, so my answer is I don't think it's going to be that big a deal, um, regardless of what you're wearing. Certainly a simple mask is probably not going to have that much of an impact. You may rebreathe more of your carbon dioxide um, than you normally would, which will make the acidosis theoretically build a little bit quicker and you might reach failure a little bit quicker, but I don't know about that. As far as wearing an N95 mask while training, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know that there might be, you know, tiny mic microfilament particles that you're inhaling and it might have some bad consequence. Um, I've had some shifts back in March when it was really, really heavy where I wore an N95 all day long and I, got to tell you that was miserable i mean sure part of what makes an n95 effective is it has a very tight seal on your face mm -hmm. um and it's that tight seal that makes it effective sure. and you know the tight seal for that long all day long is what is you know so miserable i mean i had you know petechiae and black eyes and you know mm -hmm. it, it is just no fun um but the other thing I would say, I don't know if in our facility, we used fans as part of the cooling of the environment and everything. Um, we just unplugged the fans because we didn't want to convert any droplet into aerosol. Um, We've been doing that as well. Yeah. yeah. So, but as far as in training environments, you know, the way it's done at the body coach is as safe as it can be. And as far as environments in general, um, in terms of a rate limiting factor, I think um, 
in regard to the virus, you probably have half a dozen situations during any given day that are gonna be significantly more high risk than that, exponentially more so than going to a studio that's taking the appropriate precautions. Mm. Um, and when you look in terms of across the board risk, um, even without precautions, the, the statistical danger is greater driving to the studio than it is being in the studio. Wow. So. Well, well, the last question, Doug, then would be, we, we've been, um, I think comfort is, is obviously a real factor. It's something people aren't used to. Um, productive exercise to begin with involves discomfort. And so we're, we're kind of adding discomfort. And I think especially when you think about how that's experienced and processed and it all kind of, it all kind of factors together in terms of the, uh, our mind and our brain having to deal with the, the accumulation of, of the discomfort. Um, so we've been leaning a little bit towards using a, a, a little shorter time under load set, yeah. um, even some eccentric emphasis type training right. to... Um, reduce the total discomfort someone needs to experience and also reduce the, the, the need for uh, increased um, respiratory rate and labored, labored breathing. So I guess my question though, is if we lean that way with our training and if we even hold off on more metabolic conditioning type workouts, can, can clients get the, the most important results from exercise without um, is much emphasis on what someone might call conditioning, like interval training or metabolic conditioning type yeah. workouts. Most conditioning is just kind of more of a demonstration experience than actual conditioning anyway. All of the conditioning that is created by these high intensity interval workouts is achieved during a high intensity resistance training set, even if you're doing negative only or something that's not as metabolically demanding. Hmm. You're still stressing all of the metabolic systems of the cell. Hmm. Um, so they're all getting tapped. The particular interval protocol is going to be a specific recipe or combination of those different metabolic pathways to generate a specific experience. So an interval training protocol is just allowing you to accumulate lactate and not allowing you to dissipate it completely and then accumulating it in a stair-step fashion. So that's kind of training one arm of the metabolic system to deal with and dispose of a lactic acidosis. The capability to do that is already made to be there by the resistance training protocol. This is just sort of fine-tuning a specific metabolic activity. So if for the duration of this, until this settles out somewhat, we know better how this is going to pan out in the long term. If someone just wanted to minimize that, make it not as challenging, or drop it all together, I don't think that there's anything that says you can't pick up right where you left off and re-engage that level of conditioning relatively quickly. Got it. Because you're basically training all of those metabolic pathways, but you're not doing it in a way that expresses capping them out where you'll experience it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we can, we can ask people to, to wear masks, wear them properly, work out with them on and minimize the overall discomfort of the workout um, right. by sticking to strength training and, yeah. um, and even using maybe a little bit higher load and a little less time and, and not, uh, not having to, uh, to, to, to pant yeah. and, and breathe and quite really as much. If you have clients that don't want to wear a mask, the real risk mitigation on their behalf is your instructor's wearing a mask and wearing it properly. Sure. You know, and then all the usuals, you know, wash your hands, don't touch your face, don't come to work, feel sick. Yeah. All of that stuff. Exactly. Well, that's, well, that's helpful, Doug. Well, we're just trying to do our best to do what we need to do to help people well, I, become a, a, a healthier person that's, that's, that's more uh, resilient in the face yeah. of, that's, of this that's virus. the way to do it. And I'm here to tell you that um, it's important to not just, you know, um, hunker down and not exercise. Even if someone's going to stay at home, um, take some instruction from your instructors how to keep 
um, your fitness intact while you're at home because doing the mechanical work with muscle does important things. It turns over the amino acid pool in your skeletal muscles, degrading and misfolded proteins that are in there um, need to be broken down by exercise into the constituent amino acids released in the bloodstream, reassembled into useful proteins that will serve as the backbone to a cytokine and an antibody response should you become infected. Also, the myokines that are released um, counteract the inflammasome that can run amok um, if you enter into a cytokine storm. So mm. if I could tell people, if, if you catch this and you don't want to have a bad outcome from it, exercise, avoid industrial seed oils altogether, polyunsaturated fats. Those cause you to store body fat and it causes you to store polyunsaturated fats as body fats. Those are the chemical backbone for the inflammatory cytokines. You don't want to have a lot of that hanging around and make sure your vitamin D status is good. Get some sun, take vitamin D supplement. Um, make sure you're keeping your serum vitamin D levels elevated because, you know, if by some chance you come into contact with this, you want your body to have an aggressive response that will put it down without you ever knowing that you were exposed. If you do those things, I think you're going to be good. And exercise is a big part of it. Don't miss your workouts. Well, that's great advice. Thanks, Doug. And thanks again so much for uh, giving us your time today and glad you're doing well. And we'll, we'll uh, keep, keep up the, the, the great work and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Awesome. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.